Amen. Thank you, guys. Uh, if you uh, would, please pull out a Bible. We've got some here. We're doing a series right now on the gospel and its origin. We're, we're finding the gospel in the earliest pages of Scripture in the book of Genesis. And we're actually going to be in Genesis chapter 6 this morning. So in the Bibles that we have here, that would be on page 5. Now, um, I guess what I'll do is I'll pray and then we'll get after it. But let's, let's go ahead and go before the, the Lord. Lord, we ask right now for your ministry of your, of your word. We pray for your spirit to take these words and make them alive to us, Lord. Help us to hear your voice loud and clear. Help us, Lord, to be people who respond with obedience and faith. Um, we ask right now that you would be glorified in the time that we have together here. In Jesus' name, amen. So as I was thinking about it this week, I was reminded of one of my favorite books. If you've not read this book, please do put it on your, on your list of things you need to accomplish before you die, okay? It's that important. It's the book called The Pilgrim's Progress, and it's by John Bunyan. And um, it's, a, it's an allegory. It's a, it's a story about an individual named Christian, and every person and every experience in this book is, is designed really to help us think through the experience of the Christian faith. Well, in the very beginning of the book, Christian begins to read a document, and he realizes that he's actually living in the city of destruction. And he reading this document and realizing that he lives in this place, he decides he's going to flee, that he's going to um, try to convince his family to uh, escape from the city of destruction. But you know, his family looks at him and they go, you're crazy, dude. What is wrong with you? Um, you're being super spiritual, super religious, and you're just out of your mind. But he is convinced that he is living in the city of destruction. And he, though he tries to persuade his wife and his kids to go with him. They will not go. And eventually he has to make that hard, hard, hard decision that he will go without them. And he flees. And the entire storyline is him um, experiencing the Christian faith and, and being introduced to all of these different characters and learning things along the way. And, you know, you might be offended uh, that he left his wife and kids. But later on, there's book number two where Christiana, his wife, also makes the trek. And, uh, and I was thinking about it this week because we're about to jump into a story in the Bible that often will upset people when they look at the details of it. It's the story of Noah. And, and, and the reality is that God looks at what's happening on the earth. He looks at the condition of humanity. He sees how there's a, there's a wicked bent in the heart of humanity. And, and he says, I am going to destroy the earth and its inhabitants. I'm going to flood the earth. And, and it reminded of me of the Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, the judgment of God, the city of destruction. And, and often, this is an area of Christianity that we kind of push aside. We don't want to talk about it. Uh, but, but here we find it right, right in this story, and, and we have to decide, are we going to be like Christian? Are we going to, hearing the voice of God, say, you know what, I will do whatever he calls me to do because I believe his word is faithful and true. And, and this idea of judgment and destruction, as awful as it sounds, it is a thing that is presented in the Bible, the idea of judgment, I told you uh, last week, um, it's actually the first doctrine in the Bible to be rejected. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 4, the serpent himself says, no way, you certainly will not die if you eat this fruit. God, essentially, there's this theme going where people are willing to say, no, 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 no. You don't really have to worry about the judgment of God. And the truth is, the Bible consistently puts that out there as a truth to be reckoned with. And so what do we find here? We find in the text, the 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 judgment of God, and we're going to look first at verses 5 through 8. So look with me at them. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts um, of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals and the birds and the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. So what we find here then is the judgment of God. We find that God in his perfect holiness and his righteousness looks at the rebellion and the sin and the wickedness in the world that he's made, and it deeply grieves his heart, and he has the right then to do something about it. In his, in his holiness, he's not willing to look at sin and go, eh, it's no big deal. I'm just going to wink at this and brush it away and try to excuse or minimize it. In his holiness, he is obligated to deal with sin in, in the way that's appropriate. And so he says, I'm going to wipe out the human race. I'm going to destroy everything. And again, this is one of those areas that we, we might kind of 
shrink back from and go, oh, I don't, I don't like this. I don't like this portion of the Bible. I don't like that God is willing to say things about this. But the truth is God wants us to know this truth, that there is a holiness about him and there's a, a, a judgment to come on, on evil and wickedness and sin. Now, um, I think that there are uh, presented here, there's a reality about judgment that we need to be careful with. Um, while God is willing to do it, there's a reluctance here. Um, there, there's a truth about his brokenness over the state of humanity. The, it's describing him in a way of almost regretting this, this. He's deeply troubled by the fact that the things that he has made to be in a right relationship with him has now pushed him aside. And so there's still this component of love and patience and, and, and a desire to see people come back to him. But at the same time, he is committed to this idea of holiness and to this reality of judgment. And, and the way that we can reconcile this is simply at the cross. I mean, as a Christian, I think you need to be aware that this is the only place where we can see the holiness of God and the love of God both on display simultaneously. That it is the one place where you can say God is absolutely holy and will punish sin and he is absolutely loving and gracious and kind. It is at the cross where these concepts get reconciled. I love how Carson puts it. He says it's at the cross where mercy and and justice come together. They rush at each other and they kiss. It's at the cross where we are able to say God is perfectly holy and he does not excuse or minimize sin, but he is also very loving and gracious and kind. So, then we need to be careful about how we respond to the truth of God's judgment. I think there are two inappropriate responses. One is to recoil from it and to go, no, 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 no. Uh, I cannot buy into a God like that. I cannot subscribe to a God who, is judge, who, who will execute judgment on people. I can't believe that God would make people and, and then judge them for their unwillingness to follow him. We can recoil from it, and I think many people do. They hear about God's judgment and they try to mute it or minimize it. And we say, no, 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 I'm not going to go to a church that would ever talk about things like this because it's simply not something I can buy into. And I think that that's an inappropriate response because God consistently presents this as a truth in his word, that there is a judgment to come. And though he is patient and though he is gracious, it is not something we should excuse or minimize. But another inappropriate response, and I see this more often in people who go to church, people like us at the nine o'clock, the other response that we might have is we celebrate the judgment of God. And we think about the wickedness in the world and we think about those dirty sinners and the, the thought of God judging them actually excites us that yes, it would be a good thing if God would bring about his judgment on the earth. There's a story in Luke chapter nine where the disciples, Jesus sends them ahead to make preparations for him as he's traveling to Jerusalem. And he sends the disciples ahead to make preparations. And when they get to the location in in Luke chapter 9, they're met with hostility. They're supposed to find a place where they can lodge and hang out and have a meal as they're traveling to Jerusalem. But the people there are unwilling to to put them up and they're unwilling to show them love and and concern and, and care. And so the disciples come back and they say this, and this is a language I hear, you know, this is like language I think is sometimes on the hearts of of believers. They say to Jesus, they say, hey, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy these suckers? Like they look at these people and they go, they didn't, they didn't open their doors to us. They didn't put us up. They didn't care for us. And you are the Messiah. You're the Lord of glory. If they're unwilling to entertain you and spend time with you, then clearly they're deserving of judgment. And so they're asking, hey, is this what you want us to do? We can call down God's judgment right now. Fire from heaven. We'll just smoke them. It'll be done. It'll be a lesson. Everyone will learn. And what does Jesus do? Verse 55, he looks at them and he rebukes them. In other words, God, we have to be careful about the judgment of God. We shouldn't recoil from it and think, no way, God could never do that. But we also shouldn't rejoice in it and think, man, I just hope and cannot wait for the day when God takes out all those bad guys. The truth is, Christians are people who should be like God, who should be broken and and regretful over the rebellion that we find in the world. We should be grieved over the fact that people who are made to be in a relationship with God are not living up to that high calling. Um, But at the same time, we have to be people who recognize that judgment is appropriate and God is holy and there is a day coming when God will judge the inhabitants of the earth. In fact, that's a part of how Paul describes his gospel message 
In Romans chapter 2, he talks about the fact that there's a day coming when the wrath of God will be revealed from heaven and where people will have to give an account for every idle word that they ever spoke and everything that was on their heart, and it will be through this man called Jesus Christ. And he puts it this way in Romans 2 verse 16, this will all take place on the day when God judges people's secret thoughts through Jesus Christ, just as my gospel declares. The, the truth of the judgment of God has to be a feature of how we talk about the good news. When we talk about people experiencing the good news of God, there's kind of a precursor to it. There's a reality that the good news is really good because there's also bad news. That if we live in rebellion to God, that there is a judgment for sin. That, there is a, that, that there's, a, there's a threat of the wrath of God coming against the sinfulness of humanity. But the good news is this, that God in love has made a way for that wrath to be poured out, not on me, but on his son. And when we present the good news, then we cannot mute this portion of the message. There is a judgment of God and it will happen one day. And we have these episodes, even in Genesis, where we see this is what it would be like. This is what it would be like to see the floodwaters of God's wrath poured out on people for, the, for their sinfulness. And we find it here. And I think it's very important that we would maintain that because the, the other option is to just not talk about judgment. And what we lose then is the essential element of Christianity. And, and I think a lot of people, because they're unwilling to talk about God's judgment, they end up with a Christianity that's simply self-help. There's a God who loves you. He's got a wonderful plan for you. And all you need to do is just kind of get him on board with you. And he's just going to shower his blessings out on you. And, and that self, self-help version of Christianity, it's, it's appealing and attractive and, and, and people's lives can even be beautified from it. But the reality is it's not the entire truth. The entire truth is that there is sinfulness in our hearts for which God in his perfect holiness would be fair and right to bring judgment upon. And God here, we'll see it here in just a moment, has devised a plan for us in his grace to not have to suffer the effects of our sinfulness but to be able to be forgiven and brought back into a right relationship with him. So the first thing we see here is the judgment of God. And again, it could be something that you kind of shrink back from and you go, I don't know how I feel about this, but, but hopefully you'll see as we, as we continue to work through this that God does have a beautiful plan for his people. So we see the judgment of God, but we also see here the favor of God. In the midst of humanity's rebellion, in the midst of people being wicked all the time, every day, nonstop, we find an individual and his family who has experienced the grace of God. We find a man named Noah, and, and as the Bible tells us, this individual, in the midst of all of this brokenness and all of this rebellion, this man and his family, they're, they're doing life in a different kind of way. Look at verse 8. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So yes, there, there was this pervasive wickedness here in our story, but we find an individual and his family who has experienced the favor of God. In the midst of rebellion, there is a way for people to have a, a relationship with God, to experience the favor and the grace of God. And, and he's described then in verses 9 and 10, and, and, and you see in the midst of this darkness, there's a bright light here. Verses 9 and 10, this is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And so as we're being told about this man, we're we're being made aware of the fact that he is different, that he is noticeably different, that that when he's described, he's described in a way that is uh, three different things. He's righteous. He has chosen to do the right thing. He has chosen to walk in a way that is pleasing to God. When he thinks about decisions, he is thinking in reference to his maker. So he's righteous in that regard. He's blameless among the people of his time. That when you compare him to any other individual alive at that point, you're able to say there's a difference in his character. There's a difference in his integrity. There's a difference in the way that he carries himself. And then finally, he walks faithfully with God. And that's an that's a important thing, man. This is what we want to be described as. People who walk faithfully with God. Just a little earlier in the book of Genesis, we're told about Adam walking with God in the garden. Uh, We're told about Enoch, another individual who walked with God, and that was the way that he's described in the Bible. He walked with God, and then he was carried away. And and so we we find this theme. Believers are people who want to walk with God, who want to be with God. 
there's an ability here then to be somebody who's receiving the favor and the grace of God. And, and I'm going to show you how you could be described in these, in these ways. Uh, I'm going to show you here in just a minute how you might be an individual who is able to say, I, I have experienced the favor of God. I have received the grace of God. And, and it might surprise you how it works. Um, it might surprise you how Noah comes to be this person who is described in these glowing terms. But, but let me at least say this. When you look at this text and you see these descriptors, would you please consider allowing those to be your ambition? To be described. I mean, imagine if you, when you go to work, people think about you as a righteous individual, as blameless, as somebody who walks with God. Let these descriptors be something that you would strive for. And you go, you know what? Out of all the things that I could pursue with my time and energy, this is something that I want to be true of me. I want to be righteous. I want to be blameless. I want to walk with God. And I want people to look at me and see those realities. When we think about um, Noah and the favor of God that he has received, there are some privileges to experiencing the grace. For one, um, God is telling him, I'm about to destroy everything, but I'm going to make a way for you to be saved. So the first thing, one of the privileges that we see about having the grace of God is, is a salvation. He gets to go into the boat, he gets to be with his family, and he gets spared. Another privilege uh, of this experience of God's grace is that he gets used of God um, in the sense that through him and through his family, humanity is going to be maintained, that, that life will go on after the purging. Um, and so he'll be used of God. But what we see here specifically is that there's no, another privilege. And here's what it is. It's the privilege of being aware of what God is doing. Man, as, if you're a Christian, this is an incredible opportunity. God loves to tell you what he's up to. Look how it goes, verses 11 through 13. God invites Noah into his confidence. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on the earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all the people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I'm surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So what he's doing here is God is speaking directly to his servant. And he's telling him, here's what you can expect to have come true. It's, it's a privilege that we have as believers that God reveals things to us. He'll tell us, here's what I'm up to. Here's what I'm doing. And he gives us his word in order to speak to us. But by his spirit, he also gives us impressions of the things that he's doing. And this becomes a pattern in the scriptures of how God deals with his people. In fact, Amos, a prophet later on in chapter 3, verse 7 of his book, puts it this way, surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets. You might not realize how big this is, but God wants to talk to you about what he's doing in the world. And that is an incredible privilege that God, through his word, will, will tell you, here's what I'm up to. You get an inside track on my plan in this world. You get to be made aware. You get to be brought into the, the confidence of God where he's saying, here's what I'm up to. And as a believer, as somebody who's experienced my grace, you get to be aware of that. That's pretty stinking cool. And as Christians, we have the Bible and we have the Holy Spirit of God helping us to understand these things. So we go here and we hear what God is doing and what his will is. And so we have here, in the midst of this reality of God's coming judgment, we have this this truth that there's an individual who has experienced the grace of God. And as I was telling you, I want to show you how you can receive it. Now, if you're, if you're reading this for the very first time, one of the mistakes you might make is, is to think, the reason why God put his affection on this dude is because he's righteous and he's blameless and, and he walks with the Lord. So in other words, he's a good dude. And God just looks at this good dude and says, perfect, you're my kind of guy. Get on my team. We're going to make things happen. Let me tell you what we're up to. Here's how it's going to work. You're actually going to be the, the, the new creation after all this is said and done. He's a good dude. He's, he's just doing what God wants him to do. Now, if you hear that, that is not the truth. You have to keep reading the story to find out Noah didn't get selected because of his integrity. He got selected because of God's grace. And, and the reason why he was this sort of individual is not because he was just kind of willing it out of himself. The truth is he's a lot like everyone else. The reason why he displays this character and this integrity is because he's a, he, he has faith in who God is. Uh, and there's a, there's a little um, Bible story that we read to our kids um, 
almost all the time. I mean, we read it to them. We, we go through a few different children's Bibles, and one of my favorite ones is called The Biggest Story. And really, it's a Bible story. It's a children's Bible that kind of takes all of these little individual stories, and it shows how they're all related one to another. That if you read the scriptures, it's actually one plan, one promise that's coming true. And, and so we're reading this story, and, and the, the part where we get to, to Noah, there's a line in it that I think is so important. It's describing, it's describing Noah, and it's talking about the flood, and it's talking about life after the flood. And it says this. Um, it says, it didn't take very long after the flood to, for Noah to screw up himself. Um, that's the line. It just says, that, you know, it's talking about how he goes into the boat, he and his family, all the animals, all, and, and they get saved. But then, you know what? It doesn't take very long for Noah to screw up himself. Uh, in fact, if you're just reading in the Bible that you have in front of you in chapter 9, so just right after all these events, Noah plants a vineyard and, and he drinks the wine from it and, and he does some pretty sketchy things and it affects humanity from that point forward as well. So you can't read the story and go, look, here's how salvation works. You just have to be a good person. You just have to try really hard. You just have to get, you know, kind of come to church and, and um, figure out what being a good person looks like, and that's the kind of individual that God saves. No, the truth is, the people that God save, uh, they are sinners. They're, they are sinners, but here's the difference. Sinners who place their faith in, in God. That's who Noah is. He is an individual who experiences the favor of God because he believes in who God is. In fact, in Hebrews 11, it puts it this way. It's describing Noah from a perspective, from a vantage point of the New Testament. It says this, By faith, Noah, when warned about the things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By faith, he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness that is in keeping with faith. So here's what's true of Noah. He's a believer. He has, he has heard the voice of God and he's responding with faith. And that's the reason why he is able to experience the grace and the favor of God. And so it's available to anybody. It's not, I'm not going to stand up here and say, you got to get your life in order. You got to be, you know, just well polished and, you, you know, play in the game of what Christianity needs to look like. The truth is, all of us have a little bit of that, have that sinfulness in us. All of us have that tendency to rebel against God. All of us, like Noah, um, can be sketchy. And, and like the rest of humanity who can be so inwardly focused that we forget that we have a maker, that's true of all of us. I mean, I mean we've got to be careful here because this story just reminds us the plan is not to try to get rid of all of the bad guys and just start over with good guys. It didn't work. The plan cannot be to try to figure out a, a political policy to get rid of bad guys and just have good people around because the truth is there's no such thing. There's no such thing except for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Noah then, and the favor that he receives, gives us a hopefulness that anybody, anybody can experience the grace of God if they will turn to him in faith and believe in what he has said. Now let's look then at the salvation of God. How does the salvation of God play out in this story? Well, salvation comes through a boat. If it comes through a boat. And I was thinking about this, and I, I know the feeling um, of a boat being a saving grace. When we were traveling and we were down in the southeast, uh, we were doing the action sports ministry, and we had this uh, incredible wakeboard boat that cost more than, uh, it, like, I'll never be able to afford a boat like this, but it was a sponsorship boat. So we had this boat, and we're cruising along a river that we were unfamiliar with, and you have to ask the locals, okay, where do you go? What does this look like? Are there any channels? And they said, the best water that you'll ever find is this area. You keep going, and you keep going through all of these different bends, and you're finally going to get to this area, and you'll know when you get there. It'll be glassy water. It'll be perfect. You'll have the best ride of your life. They said, but it's called Alligator Alley. And so there are a bunch of gators in there. So when you're doing this thing, you know, you just get back on the boat as quick as you can. So we're cruising down and we get to Alligator Alley and it's stupid, but this, this happens. We're, we're cruising along and we actually beach the boat on a submerged sandbar. We hit the sandbar and I'm thinking to myself, okay, first off, 
You know, normally if I'm in the Midwest, I can call Pops and he's like a superhero and he would just fly to the rescue and fix everything. But I'm like, I'm in the Southeast and we're in the middle of nowhere. We don't even have any locals with us on this boat. I have no idea what we're going to do. And I have to call, I have to call the, the dealership now and tell them, hey, I just destroyed your, your boat. I'm sorry. So I'm sitting there and I'm so anxious and I'm just like, what are we going to do? And we're like, okay, well, let's get in the water and see how bad it is. So we get into the water, a few of us get into the water, and we realize, okay, we could probably lift the back end of this thing off of the sandbar. And so we try. We start moving it, and it moves. We get it kind of kicked off the side of the sandbar, and I'm like, well, I suppose we should look and see how bad it is. You know, if all the prop is totally destroyed and all the pieces are gone, like, I don't know what we'll do, but we should figure that out. And I get under there, and I'm feeling around, and it's all fine. And... So then what, in this whole thing, as you know, alligator alley. So you're in the water and you're like swimming around going, dude, I don't like this at all. Like I am in waist deep water with alligators. And so I'm messing around. I'm like, it's fine. So we, but here's what happens. It's all fine. We fire it up and it, and it runs. So we hop in the boat and that feeling, right? That feeling of relief, that feeling of, okay, I'm not going to die right now. An alligator is not going to, that feeling is a part of what we need to see when we, re- we read this story, that the salvation of God is through this ark. It's through this boat. And, and, and it's described here in verses 14 to 18. God is telling um, Noah how to construct this boat. And he says, make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it covered uh, and coat it with a pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, 30 cubits high. Make a roof for it and leave below the roof an opening one cubit high all around. Put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. I am going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has breath, the breath of life in it, everything on earth will perish. So God says, here's where salvation is going to happen. It's going to happen in this boat. And, and Noah has to, by faith, construct this thing. And it's no small project. If you look at the details and the timeline, you realize this was a huge undertaking that he and his family went through. That there was a season where by faith, he's building a boat in the middle of an arid desert area and and he has to believe God's word is true. Even if I don't understand all of the details of it, his word is true and I'm going to trust him. And again, Hebrews 11 tells us that was an activity of faith. That he believed that God was being truthful when he declared, I'm going to destroy everything. And by faith, Noah's saying, I trust you, God, and I will do everything that you tell me to do. So he builds this boat, and he and his family get inside of it, and, and, um, and salvation comes to them as they are spared from the floodwaters of judgment. And the thing is that I want you guys to be aware of, Christians are people who are like Noah. We recognize that there's a judgment, of, there's floodwaters of judgment that are going to come upon sin one day. That Jesus is going to return and he's gonna, there's going to be an accounting for everything that's ever happened. And Christians are the people who say, that is true, but God has made a saving way. And that saving way is not just really, a, it's not a boat necessarily. That boat points to something even better. It points to the salvation that we have in Christ. We are saved by placing our faith, placing ourselves into the covering that God has given us in his son. Christians are people who are like Noah, who believe God's word, and we say, look, I'm going there, I'm going in, I'm trusting in this, this is the way of salvation. Um, Pilgrim's Progress, that's kind of what we're doing. We're saying, God is truthful, even if I can't convince anybody else, this is what he has said, and I am going to pursue his way, and I'm going to believe him, and I'm going to go after the things that he tells me to do, even if everyone else thinks I'm crazy. Jesus is the way of salvation. That's what 1 Peter 3 talks about. It talks about this reality of the saving work of God being true in the midst of the floodwaters of judgment. That saving work isn't just the boat that Noah built. It's actually pointing to the work that God is going to do through his son. And and in 1 Peter 2, it even ties it to baptism. And it says, this is the experience that we have. Uh, This is the salvation that we have as believers. We are people who have trusted in Christ and experienced the provision that God has made for us. So salvation, the salvation of God is... is, um, is in Christ, but it's also a promise. Part of the gospel message, part of the saving work of God is, is the promise that God is going to do. In verses 18 to 22, we see that God is making a promise to his people. 
Verse 18 puts it this way. I will establish my covenant with you and you will enter the ark. You, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. He's saying, I will be in a relationship with you. This is the first time in the Bible where that word covenant shows up and it is a very important word. It's where God is saying, I am choosing to relate to a people in a specific way and they can count on it. I am declaring myself in a relationship with them. I am binding myself to these people. And he's telling Noah, this is the covenant with you. If you enter this ark, if you build this thing, you, it'll get spelled out along the way, but he's essentially saying, it is through you then that you will be my people and I will be your God and I will dwell with you. Noah is a believer in that truth. He is a covenant member of God's family. And so God is saying, I'm committing myself to you. Now, when God does this, it is a commitment of grace. Again, it's God saying, I'm fully aware of who you are and what's in your heart. I'm fully aware of what you're going to do as soon as you get out of the boat. But here's what's true. I am going to covenant myself to you. I'm going to be in a relationship with you. And and here's what you need to do then. You need to believe in me. You need to trust in me. And Noah has made that his habit. He, hearing the voice of God, he does what God tells him to do. One commentator points out that after this is all said and done, after they've been on the boat for who knows how long, maybe a year, um, when, when when the door opens... Noah doesn't even take a step outside of the boat without hearing the voice of God. He's a person who hears God's voice and says, I will do what God says. I believe God. He's a person of faith. That promise is a part of the gospel message. It is is the the promise that God is going to be in a relationship with us. And and that's, that's what the gospel is, that God is saying, I have made a way. You don't have to figure this thing out all on your own. You don't have to prove yourself to be worthy of this reality. You just have to believe. Then Noah, this is um, why I think he's so incredible. He displays what will later be called obedience of faith. When God tells him to do something, he does it. Look at verse 22 at the end there. After giving him more instructions, Noah is described in this way. He did everything as God commanded him. He did everything as God commanded him, and that will show up again and again throughout this story. Noah is a person who, having heard the voice of God, does everything as God has commanded him. And so, going back to how he's described, I just want to say, this is who we become. We're we're made Christians not because of our good works, but our good works display the faith that we have in God. Um, We begin to become people who are righteous and blameless and walking with God. And and that's not how we earn a relationship, but that's evidence that we have one. And and so we see that here in this story as Noah's described doing everything that the Lord has commanded him to do. In just a few minutes, Lorian's going to get baptized. And if you guys want to get ready for that, you can right now. I'm going to wrap things up here momentarily. Um, As 1 Peter describes, this experience of salvation is the experience of trusting in Christ. It's believing that there's a judgment of God to come and and recognizing that God has made a way for you to escape the wrath of his judgment. He, is, he has given us his son. He's given us his son. And he's able to say, in love, here's, here's what I'm willing to do. I'm not willing to dismiss sin entirely. I'm not willing to pretend that it is unoffensive. That the people that I've made for myself live in rebellion to me. That is punishable. And the wages of sin is death. But here's what he says. I will not visit that death upon you. Instead, I will place my wrath, I will exhaust my wrath on my son. That's how much I care about you. That's how much I want to be in a relationship with you. I will covenant with you. And here's what you need to do. You need to get in the ark. You need to trust what God has done by sending his son. You need to place yourself by faith into the son of God and realize that the punishment that you deserve for your own sinfulness, God is willing to train to the one that he loves, his son. And Christ is willing to give you the obedience and the righteousness that he himself earned and place that on you. It's the greatest exchange. God is willing to save you. But here's what you need to do. You need to trust in his son. You need to trust in his promise. You need to place yourself by faith into the salvation that God has given to you in Jesus Christ. So let's pray and, um, and thank God for that salvation. Lord, we right now recognize the beauty of the offer that you've given to us. And Lord, we confess that too often, I confess this, Lord, too often I don't think about the judgment to come. 
I don't think about the reality that my sin deserves death. I try to make light of it and pretend it is not that significant. But the cross tells me otherwise. The cross reminds me that my sin had to be fully punished. And I thank you, God, that that was punished on your son and not me. Lord, I pray for all of my friends and family in here this morning, and I pray that all of us would have experiences of faith this morning, that we would remember our own sinfulness, our own tendencies. Lord, help us to believe that, that we're sinners too, and let that affect the way that we deal with other people. Let us be gracious and kind and patient. Let us be reluctant when we think about your, your judgment, because we, we know, God, that your timing is different. And you're giving us more and more time so that more and more people could place their faith in your son. And we thank you for him and pray in his name. Amen.